Good afternoon. Today we're going to be talking about a brief history of Korea from 1392 to the present. Now for the students that are actually in the class, you can take a look at the outline that's on that board there. For those of you following along at home, you're just going to have to listen. So we're starting at 1392 AD, even though the history of Korea is quite rich and diverse. And this is, dates back several thousand years. We can actually trace the development of Korea history back about three or four thousand years. We're starting with 1392, however, because that's the beginning of the Chosan Dynasty from 1392 to 1910. And one of the reasons we're talking about the Chosan Dynasty is because of the significant effect it had on contemporary and 20th century Korean culture, literature, history. So I'm not going to go over in a great detail about the history of, Chos of the Chosan Dynasty because this is a literature class. I am, however, going to be talking about Confucianism and several key aspects within it. So, Confucianism, based on the Chinese gentleman Confucius, this came over to Korea sometime during the Chosun Dynasty. And this is the philosophical system that is still reigning supreme in quite a few Asian countries, including China, Korea, and Japan. There are several key tenets in Confucianism. There's no real codified law or list of rules, but there are a series of precepts or guidelines for a Confucius gentleman gentle man to follow. Those include the distinction between law and ritual, relationships between family members and strangers, filial piety, loyalty, how outsiders are treated, and how women are treated. So in a country that's ruled by penal law, external authorities give out punishments after the crime takes place, such as ours. If you commit a crime here in Canada, such as stealing something, the police will come after you later. This is how the penal code in our country works. In the uh, system of Confucianism, it works a little bit differently. Instead of you do something wrong and then the cops come after and punish you later, in Confucianism, it's expected that you've internalized the rules and laws of the country. And you avoid being a criminal. You act as you should be at all times. And by and large, this works really well in a Confucius system. So what I mean by this is that, like I said, in Canada, you commit a crime, you're a criminal. You go to jail, you might be able to get your way out of, a, out of jail and become a citizen again. In Korean culture, in a Confucius culture, what happens is, if you break this, these rules of established law and order, you are branded a criminal, and you are then put outside of the entire society, essentially. I've got a gentleman in my classroom who's wanting to use the washroom, so you know you can, you can just... Oh, you want to get a pen. He wants to get a pen. <laughs> so he's going to get a pen. We're not going to wait for him. So, yeah. law versus ritual. <clears throat> So, the patterns of behavior are internalized so that people stop themselves before the crime is committed. This concept is known as saving face. And in Korea in particular, it's what we're talking about today, saving face is incredibly important. So if you do something bad, not even, not even anything criminally wrong, but if you do something bad, you want to minimize the effects of this as much as possible. So say, for instance, that I'm a businessman in Korea, and I embezzled a large amount of money. I would want, obviously, to hide this fact, but if it was found out, I would want to avoid the ramifications of this as much as possible. That could be by killing myself. That could be by escaping to a different country. The police do come, and the police would get you eventually. And in modern Korea, there's both the existence of ritual and law, but, for most Koreans and most people living under a Confucius society, they want to avoid the punishment. They want to be a part of Korean society. Relationships. Relationships in the Chosun dynasty between different castes were very important. In our society today, we've got plumbers, and we've got carpenters, and we've got teachers, and we've got police officers. They can all be friends. There's nothing wrong with me as a teacher having a friend who is a high-priced lawyer. That's fine. In the Chosun dynasty, however, and under the system of Confucianism, that is not as acceptable. It's not wasn't acceptable at all, in fact. 
You are part of a specific caste. You are friends within that caste. You do not talk to people who are lower. People who are higher than you do not talk to you, do not socialize with you. Even in Korea today, when you meet somebody for the first time, there are a series of questions that are asked. For instance, how old are you? What is your job? Are you married? Do you have any children? This is to determine the social level of each individual. When I was working in Korea, I worked in a, in a private school, they asked me these questions. They asked me, you know, how old am I? How many kids do I have? I had, this is just an example, I had a son. And none of the other workers at this place had a son. They all had daughters. Not one of them had a son. I didn't really think about how unusual that was until now. But if I were actually Korean and not an outsider, and if I was on the same level as a person, you know, same age, same level of education, all of that was the same, but I had a son, and the other guy had a daughter, I would be slightly above him. And remember how we talked yesterday about, about the different levels of politeness in Korean society. If we were living in the Chosun dynasty, and I had a son, and he had a daughter, then they would probably be required, or they would probably feel obligated, to talk to me using a more polite form. Nowadays, and because I was an outsider, that didn't happen. I didn't even speak Korean. They spoke to me in English. I spoke back in English. It was all good. Relationships. Filial piety refers to respect in the family relationship. We all here have fathers and mothers. And to a certain extent, we show our fathers and mothers respect. In Korea, in a Confucius society, today and back during the Chosun dynasty, it was critically important for you to respect your parents. Critically important. In the Old Testament, it talks about honoring your father and mother. There are rules about what should happen to a child who doesn't do that. Very strict and very harsh rules. The same thing, similar thing, happened during the Chosun dynasty under the system of Confucianism. If you don't respect your father, you could be outcast from the family. And respect could be interpreted in a, in a variety of ways. It could be talking back, it could be striking him, it could be stealing from him, it could be just, you know, not bowing properly. But in this society, you needed to show respect for the male, older members of your family. Younger brother to older brother, show respect. Brother to father, show respect. Father to grandfather, show respect. And this needed to take place. In today's society, this is still in existence. If you are an employer, employee, you must show respect to your employer. For your parents, you must show respect to them. And it's no longer a case that you're going to get expelled from society. This, this goes back to the idea of law versus ritual that we were talking about. There's no law that says that you must respect your father. On the other hand, the rituals have been internalized to the point that you must obey your father. Because the consequences are unthinkable if you don't. We talked a little bit about, um, about loyalty to family but, and loyalty to employers, but I want to emphasize that again. There are, you need to be loyal to your parents. You need to be loyal to your family. You need to be loyal to your country. This is related to social class. If you don't show loyalty, if you break these ties of loyalty, again, you could be outcast from your position. It's a concept that, again, ties back to the idea of ritual. There's no laws that say you must be completely loyal to your employer. But it's something that, again, has been internalized to the point that you absolutely must do it. The Confucius gentleman. The gentleman who embodies all of these ideals is the pinnacle of Chosun society. He needs the proper ritual, piety, and loyalty in all of his actions and all of his behaviors. And the proper Confucius gentlemen aspired to civil service. They would try to become a governmental employee. This was the pinnacle, the pinnacle of life for a Korean man at this time. Now notice I say Confucian gentlemen. Confucian gentlewoman, her only duty was to be incredibly respectful and loyal to her to the male figure in her life. If she was married, that would be her husband. If, it was, if she was not married, then it would be to her father. And I've got some very dirty looks from the women who are in the class right now, but that's the way it was. And again, to a certain extent, that's the way it still is today. Women can today get jobs, and they can go and they can live by themselves. 
they can go to university. There aren't as many social barriers as there were back then. Very good. Yeah. It looked like one of the male members of my class was trying to show dominance towards one of the female members, but I'd like to remind everybody that this is not Korea. Sure. In Canada, we are all equal. LOL. Oh, well. oh. Perfect. Okay. Outsiders. All of us here are outsiders. We are outsiders from Korean culture. And in fact, as far as I know, there are very, very few. Very few. I, I'm specifically thinking about the first time that a foreigner was made a Korean citizen. I don't think that there are that many. There are very few people who have actually gone all the way and have been able to become citizens of Korea who were not born in Korea or of Korean parents. For Canadians, you can come to Canada, you can live here for a certain amount of time, you can take certain tests, and then boom, Canadian citizen, you're all equal. In Korea, it's not like that. You're an outsider. During the Confucius uh, time, the dynasty, if you were a non-Korean, if you were a foreigner, you're actually lower on the social scale than the lowest of slaves. A slave in Korea would have been better off than a foreigner. And in fact, in certain cases, that's how foreigners were treated. It was a very closed society, and to a certain extent, it is still a fairly closed society, but of course it has opened up. This attitude against foreigners changed somewhat in the 19th century, but there are still prejudices against, but against outsiders. And it could be out like dislike, outright dislike. I heard a person say in English towards me, I hate foreigners. They hated me. They didn't even know me. They were walking down the street. But they knew enough English to say I hate foreigners. <laughs> the more common attitude is condescension. So, oh, that foreigner doesn't know what they're doing. They need to help. Um, oh, it's okay for that foreigner to screw up because, you know, they're a foreigner. Whether that's voiced or not, it's still an attitude that, that is, I don't want to say prevalent, but is still present in Korean society. Of course, there are many Koreans out there that have no issues with foreigners whatsoever. They hire them, they want to be, they want to be friends with them, not an issue. But that attitude still lingers in the back of the minds of, of many people. So, in Korea, especially during this time, Moving away from the idea of Confucianism, there was a very large divide between popular and high literature. In our culture, in Western culture, we would consider high literature to be Shakespeare, some of the great poets of the 18th and 19th centuries. People would, might even argue that there aren't really any great high literature writers in the Western, in the Western world in the 20th and 21st century. George Eliot and maybe T.S. Eliot, and they, they might. They might qualify, but by and large, that we do have this division between popular, you know, Tom Clancy, and high literature Shakespeare in our own culture. During the uh, Chosun Dynasty, it was an even sharper divide. Popular literature was written by Koreans in the Korean language. High literature was almost exclusively the Chinese classics. So, water margin. I'm trying to think of any other aside from water margin. Can't think of any other ones off the top of my head. So the classic stories written in China, written in Chinese, these were considered the epitome of literature in Korea. And as I said, Korea at this time was based on the Confucius system. Everything that was Chinese is venerated at this time. If you wanted to become a civil servant, and remember I talked about how this was important for any Confucius gentleman to aspire to. If you wanted to be a part of the government, you needed to know the Chinese classics of literature. Think about that. If you wanted to be a lawmaker in Korea, you needed to know Chinese works of literature. That was how important the idea of Confucianism the idea of Chinese culture and literature was important in Korea at this time. <laughs> so, the importance of Chinese literature. We've briefly talked about that, but 
I want to emphasize again, if you were a scholar in Korea, you would know Chinese to the extent that you'd be able to read it, speak it, even write it. We do have extant poems from the Joseon Dynasty that are Korean poems, but they're written in Chinese. And at the time, people who were nobles, people who were more elevated, they would choose to write in Chinese as opposed to writing Korean. Korean poetry at the time was for the common people. Folk songs, poetry, they were written for the people. But if you were writing for an intellectual group, you would write it in Chinese. So this is just a little taste of what life was like during the Cho Chosun Dynasty. This is a little bit of a background of, of what Korean wa life was like going into the occupation, the period of occupation. So we're going to move on to our next point, Korea under Japanese rule, 1910 to 1945. And I've said 1910 because that's the, that's the year in which Korea was actually annexed and made a part of the Japanese Empire. But in reality, there's, there's a huge delineation of, of when this actually took place. For instance, in 1905, Korea was occupied. But it wasn't really taken control over, even though it sort of was. So in 1905, the Japanese invaded. They kept the Korean um, monarchy in government. So the Koreans were nominally in charge, but really it was the Japanese who were making the decisions. But in 1910, that's when Japan was annexed. And there's some controversy even over that. Because the basic fact of this annexation is still under dispute. The Koreans assert that Emperor Gojong used a fake seal, therefore his order to surrender was invalid. So he was given a piece of paper, he was supposed to use a, a seal, like a stamp, as a signature, saying that, yes, we give up control of Korea to Japan. But Koreans to this day assert that this was, it was not the right seal, therefore it was invalid, and it was completely illegal for Japanese to come and annex Korea. The Japanese obviously disagree with this. The day that the treaty was put into effect, August 29th, is still known as the Day of Shame in Korea. Now, life under the Japanese during the occupation was very harsh. Very harsh. This is one of the darkest times in the history of Korea. Jap the Japanese people sought to eliminate Korean culture, and they perpetuated it, they attempted to perpetuate cultural genocide. And I don't use that term lightly, I mean it literally, cultural genocide. So what they did was they removed the Chosun hierarchy, so the emperor was no longer the emperor. The Korean palace was destroyed. There was an extremely strict set of rules that was put into place, like for instance, if you don't pay your taxes, you get the death penalty. Think about that. You don't pay your taxes, you get the death penalty. Extremely harsh. Um, in 1919, there was an uprising. This is when Emperor Gojong died. He was rumored to have been poisoned. In 1919, on March 1st, there were uh, peaceful rallies that took place throughout Korea. So Koreans peacefully demonstrated against Japanese rule. On this day, 7,000 Korean people were died. There's one particular town, um, Jamri, in particular where the Japanese soldiers and the Japanese government took Korean Christians, they crucified some of them, they herded others into a church and set it on fire and burned these people alive. This was an extremely harsh and brutal reaction to what was a peaceful demonstration. After this point, and the, the cultural genocide keeps on getting more intense, after this point, all Korean citizens were required to follow Shintoism and worship at Shinto shrines. Now, I don't know how much you folks know about Shintoism, but this is the veneration of Japanese ancestors, of Japanese, famous Japanese people who had died, and your grandfather, and your great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents. So Korean people were forced to worship these Japanese dead spirits, which was a huge affront to their own religious beliefs. At school, the Korean language was oppressed. You could no longer speak Korean. You no longer learned about Korean history. The language itself was eventually banned, with everybody being forced to speak in Japanese. And finally, towards the end of this period, even Korean names were not allowed to be used. You must name your child a Japanese name. Now, if you think about it, for a culture that has had you know, hundreds of years 
of tradition within, during the Chosun dynasty. To not be allowed to name your child what you want to because another group of people is telling you that you can't. You must name it after their people, their culture, their language. It was considered to be hugely offensive. But the Koreans would, of course, name their child a Japanese name and enter it on the rolls and all that, but they would still give them their own Korean names, secret names, that they would actually use in the family. And finally, towards the end of World War II, we have two very dark parts in Korean history. The first one is regarding the comfort women during World War II, and then Unit 731. Unit 731 is another board, but I wanted to talk about that anyway. So towards the end, middle end of, of World War II, the Japanese people started to take Korean women hostage. They would kidnap them, essentially, from their homes, and they would force them to be sex slaves. They would ship them off to the front, to various places around the Asian theater. They would set up brothels, and Japanese soldiers would rape these women repeatedly. It was, uh, we, can, we can't even imagine this. It's, it's, it's horrific. But what makes it even more horrific today is that to a certain extent the Japanese government refuses to admit this happened. The Japanese government say that these people, these comfort women, comfort women, which is a euphemism if you've ever heard one, that these comfort women were, were volunteers. But if you talk to the comfort women from Korea and from the other countries around the Asian theater that were conquered by Japan, it's obvious that they, they, this was not voluntary. If you hear the stories that came out of Korea, you would know that this is not voluntary at all. Estimates range from 10,000 to 200,000 comfort women who were raped during World War II. Even if it's only 10,000, only 10,000, it's still mass rape on a scale that did not take place anywhere else in the 20th century. The second aspect, horrific aspect, about the occupation uh, during World War II in particular was what was called Unit 731. Now, I don't, again, I don't know how much you folks know about, um, about the Nazis and their experimentation with, with Jewish prisoners, but the Japanese did very much the same thing in Unit 731. They would take Koreans and Chinese people and Thai and other nationalities around the Asian theater, and they would torture them. They would push the human body to see how far it could go. You could look all this up online if you really have the stomach for it. What it. Is that like a place? It's, it was the camp, yes, where this was done. Very much like a concentration camp. But instead of just persecuting Jews, they would, the Japanese took pretty much anybody that, that they wanted. So. And then finally we come to the divided kingdom, 1945 to the present. As we know, the Japanese surrendered after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And after World War II, they had to give up all their claims to the territories that they had conquered, including Korea. So imagine this, from 1392 to 1910, for 618 years, Korea was able to manage itself, was able to govern itself. The Chosun dynasty is the longest running dynasty in the history of the world. But in 1945, all of that was in shambles. So it was believed that, you know, because of this 35 years of occupation, that the Koreans needed help. And the people who largely decided this was the United States and the USSR. They said, okay, Korea needs help. And there was an accord between the US and the USSR that divided Korea along the 38th parallel. I'm going to write that down because that's an important phrase. 38th. That was in the book. Indeed, it is in the story of the Koreans. So anything north of the 38th parallel would be uh, administered by the USSR. Anything south of it would be administered by America. There was resistance. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the division was originally supposed to be only for five years to help the country get back on its feet. At that point, five years later, in 1950, there was supposed to be one of these two governments that was going to take over the entire Korea. Now you can see the problem. We've got this occupation where the Japanese are in control. 
And then we've got another smaller occupation to a certain extent. I mean, the United States and the USSR, they had good intentions. But ultimately, this division only propagated the, the, the Cold War. This division was along ideological lines. The Soviets came in and they tried to model the North Korean government after their own. The Americans came and tried to model their government after their own, just as would make sense. But after five years, saying, okay, one of these two ideological systems is going to control the entire country, it's obvious that there were going to be some problems. Both governments wanted to be in control. So in 1950, in June, the United Nations <coughs> declares that South Korea, the government of South Korea, has the right to rule a unified Korea. So 1945, it's split. In 1950, the United Nations says, okay, South Korea, your government is going to be in charge. That month, North Korea invades South Korea. Instead of going peacefully, North Korea decides they are not going to give us the country, so we are going to take it by force. And this begins one of the bloodiest civil wars in the 20th century. I'm not going to talk about a lot about the North Korean War. I'm sure you've covered that in the classes. The war ended in a stalemate. It's not over. The Korean War is still officially going on. There are still border conflicts. There are still warships that, that shoot against each other. There are still kidnappings on the part of North Korea, perhaps South Korea, we're not sure. But it's still going on. And the, the area around the 30th parallel is a no man's land because they're still at war. So then we have the division between North Korea and South Korea, who over the past several decades since, since 1950, have developed into their own countries. And there's even a language division to a certain extent between these two countries. Because they're at war, they don't get along, and North Korea has consciously chosen to use some terminology that's different from South Korea. So the language itself has even split apart slightly. North Korea was modeled, obviously, after the Stalinist model. They were modeled on a Soviet style of government. From 1950 to 1980, they were initially very rich. In North Korea, it's a very mountainous region. They have a lot of ores. They were able to do a lot of mining. They were able to, to be quite rich. To a certain extent, this is because the USSR wanted to help them out. You've got North Korea and South Korea right beside each other. Obviously, the United States and Russia could not go to war against each other because that might ignite a global conflict. So North Korea and South Korea, this country was in a, a campaign in which both the United States and the USSR could play, could play puppet masters and could perpetuate the Cold War without it actually being between the United States and the USSR. So they were initially rich. In the 1980s and 1990s, there was economic disaster in the country. The main reason behind that is because there was a series of floods and tsunamis that devastated what little farming region North Korea did have. As I said, it's mostly mountainous. But also, there was, um, there was market crashes throughout the world. And as a result, their economy suffered quite heavily. So up to 1980, 1985, North Korea was doing well. There was a certain part in North Korea's history where their money was actually worth more than South Korea's money, and they were doing better on a national scale than South Korea was. But since this economic downturn in the 90s, North Korea has not recovered. And as we know from listening to the news, it's become quite an oppressive government. In North Korea today, one example of this is that there are still Nazi-style concentration camps. As we've seen so often, in 20th century history. In Germany, they put Jews and other dissenters into these camps and tried to eradicate them. In Japan, they tried to use, or in, in Korea occupied Japan, they used everything at their disposal in order to turn Koreans into Japanese. In North Korea, people who were considered to be dissenters, who said anything negative about the government there, they were put into these brutal camps. And again, you can look at the history of this, but when I say that they are Nazi-style concentration camps that are still in existence right now, as you listen to this and as you watch it, I'm not exaggerating at all. 
South Korea, on their other hand, as I said, it was based on a democratic model. It was based on a democratic model. But after the division, there were a series of military dictatorships in the country that was fairly oppressive and is reminiscent of what North Korea is like today. There were true democratic reforms in the 1980s that led Korea to where it is today, a true democracy that is, it is modeled on American style, an American style republic, but as a result of the decisions they made, South Korea is a powerhouse in consumer electronics today. LG, Samsung, these are Korean companies. Kia, Hyundai, these are Korean companies. A lot of the um, finer, Mitsubishi is not. A lot of the finer electronics that we see in devices such as the iPad, they're manufactured in Korea. Economic powerhouse. So, this is just a brief taste of Korean history from 1392 to the present. Obviously, we can't touch on anything. Hopefully, this gives you a bit of an outline of where Korea is and what it is today. Cool.